This is Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine. Joining me for this conversation is Nazi Saheb Zamani. Nazi is an IB teacher at Robinson High School in Tampa. Nazi, are there a few challenges teaching IB students? So one of the challenges in teaching uh, any student is trying to reintroduce old um, concepts and new refreshing ways that can grab the students' attention. Yeah, students are really different these days than in our day, mm -hmm. right? So they need new ways of learning, absolutely. Today we're going to talk about some of the world's more notable organizations. NATO, the Peace Corps, and the World Health Organizations are a few examples. But more specifically, we're going to talk about when government and citizens participate in those organizations. Nazi, what shall we start with? I think I would love to know how citizens can participate in international organizations. You know, that's a great question to start with because when we talk about civics and citizenship, we often talk about citizens being directly connected to their leaders, and so we often emphasize local government, for example. Yet, in a 21st century world, we are very inclined to interacting and interfacing with international organizations. There are all kinds of ways for citizens to learn about what's going on in the world and if citizens believe that there is a way to try to offset a problem or to provide some kind of a support, there are all kinds of ways for them to do that. So the internet and social media have really provided excellent ways for citizens to get involved in international organizations. But at the same time, we know that citizens also get involved through protest activities and other kinds of on-the-ground activities as well. And how do you think um, these organizations that average citizens get involved with influence their governments? Well, I think because they're, by, by the citizens saying, I'm getting involved in this, then they're sort of putting those governments and the U.S. government on notice, right? They're putting those governments on notice that they're paying attention. And in the process of paying attention, that means that these governments can know that they're not going whatever they do is going to be sort of talked about and communicated about. And so that becomes, you know, really very important and very interesting. Um, I'll tell you something sort of in a very personal way. Um, you know, back in the late 1970s, the United Nations uh, designated October 16th of every year, starting in 1982, to be World Food Day. And what that meant was that was a day to raise awareness about hunger and the consequences of hunger and how hunger can be stopped. And so now, World Food Day is observed every year on October 16th. Not that there aren't hungry people every other day of the year, of course. But in doing that, if you go onto the United Nations website, for example, and you can see that you can sign a petition online, you can find about, out about organizations that will um, uh, accept money through the UN, that will accept money to try to offset the fact that we have so many starving people in the world. And that is an international problem because when you're talking about something as simple as hunger, we're talking about the idea that people cannot be productive citizens, that people are then vulnerable, that if people's hunger needs are not met, then how can they go to school? How can they do other things with their lives? How can they be good parents? How can they be good workers if they're hungry? And so certainly, if you realize that using the internet and using other kinds of social media helps your awareness of problems, it's also a vehicle for addressing those problems. It's great. You were mentioning the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to, some of the kids may have heard of the, the term United Nations, but they're still not familiar with what it is and its role in the world. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. The United Nations was formed after World War II. And the United Nations was formed in what we call a confederacy, meaning that there is no sort of governing authority over other nations. It's basically every nation sort of choosing to join the United Nations, if they are welcomed into the United Nations, they are agreeing to abide by certain protocols, right, in terms of how they relate to one another, how they communicate with one another. And then the United Nations, which is headquartered in New York City, 
then deals with sort of world issues. And it is important to talk about the United Nations because there was a United Nations-like entity that was created at the end of World War I called the League of Nations, but the United States never joined. So for the United States to not only have joined the United Nations, but to headquarter the United Nations sort of speaks a completely different perspective of the United States in terms of how it relates to other nations. And the United Nations deals with everything from international security issues to issues, as I said, about hunger, to issues about you know things going on in indigenous uh, among indigenous populations, meaning populations that are focused in just one particular area of a country or of a, of a nation or of a what, of a region. And many people might say, well, you know, if those those are problems, if if South Africa is doing this, or if you know a country in um, in Asia is doing that, well, that's in that's only for that country to be concerned with because those are indigenous peoples. But it really isn't the case at all. I mean, when we're talking about things like human rights and other kinds of things, those are issues that are of concern to the world. Well, that's a great segue because I would like to know how the United Nations has helped promote issues like human rights or children's rights or women's rights throughout the world. Well, you know, the United Nations has played a, a critical role in raising awareness. You know, I remember when I was really, really young and on Halloween every year, I would have a, you know, a little bag for candy, and then I'd also have a little box for UNICEF. So even in elementary school, I was going door to door collecting pennies for UNICEF. And this United Nations Children's Emergency Fund um, is there to sort of deal with issues about dealing with children and children's issues and children's needs. The United Nations also um, deals with those conflicts either between nations or within nations that they either can't or won't deal with themselves. So by having sort of these general principles in place about sort of what is how every nation should treat its people, then consequently um, the United Nations then will intervene as a result if they determine that there are certain um, nations that are not abiding by those principles. So they then have the authority, it's a self, it's, it's given to, they give it to themselves, but they have the authority to then step in and to intervene to try to prevent um, certain circumstances from either happening or from getting worse. Now you talked about two very vulnerable populations, women and children. And what the United Nations has done is they have sort of adopted these uh, policies, if you will, these declarations, and essentially saying, we declare that there are certain rights that people have just for being born. And once you are born, you are entitled to certain rights, protections, and privileges. So for example, if you look at the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, okay, things we take for granted, Nazi, that children are entitled to a name. The idea of not having a name, not having a, a means of identifying you, which then gives you certain legal rights. But if you don't even have a name, if you don't have a family, the idea that you have a right to have uh, parents, right? So that, that means that if you're an orphan, then the argument is that the United Nations would like you to not be raised in an orphanage, but to be raised in a family. Um, one of the um, unfortunate consequences of war is that the most vulnerable populations are taken sort of as um, booty, so to speak. And so women especially have been victimized um, in, during wartime as rape victims. And so consequently, if you have two nations or two tribes at war with one another and rape is a... Um, a method of warfare, then those women are left then with very few options because on the one hand, especially if they become pregnant as a result of the rape, on the one hand they then have a child that belongs to this warring nation and on the other hand they've been spoiled for the nation that they belong to. So that leaves these women in extremely vulnerable situations, um, particularly um, when we're talking about um, uh, refugees, right? The fact that the United Nations has taken positions on refugees and whether or not 
um, you know, how, we, how refugees are treated and how refugees are acknowledged. Now, one of the things that, you know, we often talk about is, well, what does this have to do with me? It has everything to do with you because every nation, particularly since the end of World War II, is at risk of war by a nation from any other place on earth, right? Geography isn't there for us to um, sort of keep us safe, so to speak. Say, well, you know, we're protected by two oceans, two friendly nations, that's it. That's not the case anymore at all. One of the things that happened at the, uh, during World War II that the UN has taken a position on is something called genocide. Genocide is this idea of, of one group trying to obliterate another group. And so the effort to obliterate another group is called genocide. And what we don't even realize is that genocide wasn't even a word until um, World War II, right? There was, for example, in the early part of the 20th century, there was the Armenian Genocide. But nonetheless, the United Nations in sort of, they legitimized the concept of genocide and thus the requirement for intervention by saying genocide is a word. And the word means that one group is trying to obliterate another group because of its religion, because of its race, but just the idea that you obliterate the entire group and in doing so, of course, ensure that then there will be no more generations of that group as well. And so the United Nations has basically said that if they identify something as a genocide, then they are going to intervene at a level above that which if they said that there was sort of conflict between nations or some other lower level of intervention needed. Now I'm, I'm wondering if you have just even one more question because we have just a little bit more time and I'm having such a great time with this conversation. Yeah, can you tell me about the Peace Corps and how it influences and changes things that are happening around the world? You know, the Peace Corps was started in the 1960s by Sergeant Shriver. Sergeant Shriver uh, eventually ran uh, for vice president, but, you know, he is sort of well known because he was married to uh, one of the Kennedy sisters and, and so forth. But um, Sergeant Shriver sort of started the Peace Corps with the idea of sending American citizens overseas to work. In, um, very, in very impoverished areas, in areas that needed all kinds of expertise. So for example, if you have a good engineering background, if you have a good language background, if you have a good teaching background, for you to go to another country and to use those skills to help that area. So for example, to bring water to a village and to work towards bringing water to a, a village. Not only does that raise awareness in the United States, which is where we started this conversation, how can citizens get involved, mm -hmm. right? It not only raises awareness about the fact that what does it mean if you don't have clean water in your village? What does it mean in terms of the health and the health of children and infant mortality and other kinds of things? But what it also does is, is it also brings us uh, out into the world in this, in this voluntary capacity to try to make the world a better place. And so it also sort of sees to it that the United States is a world leader in this other way, right? At the end of World War II, um, the United States might have been seen as a world leader in terms of being a warring nation, right? The fact that the US used these atomic bombs, but to go out bringing peace, and you bring peace by bringing stability, by bringing infrastructure, by, by bringing other kinds of benefits to communities that otherwise wouldn't have them. And the idea is, is that you make those communities better by helping those communities and not changing the community uh, structurally in terms of its integrity, but just bringing water, bringing education, bringing literacy skills and other kinds of things to these other communities in the world. We've been talking about international organizations and the ways in which government and ordinary people participate in those organizations. That's Conversations in Civics. I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine.